Hi. Thank you for being here. They said it was going to be light in the room, but man, is it light in this room. Uh, welcome uh, to Alibis for Interaction. The reason it's light in this room is twofold. We're recording as much as we can of the talks, um, but we also want to be in the same space uh, so that we can see each other's faces, so that it doesn't feel like, oh, this thing is happening on the stage and you get to like watch in awe. That's not how we roll here. Um, my name is Johanna Kolyanen. I'll be your guide on, on this stage for the next two days. Uh, and I also have the delightful task of giving an introductory lecture. It sounds very grand. We have all kinds of supporters, it's wonderful. And I also see you so much better from here, so that, that's very, very pleasing. Whew. Whew. Yeah. Uh, my headline is the following, an introduction to narrative experience design. A lot of big words. The goal of this is that, that at the end of this, it won't feel like big words at all. Um, in fact, everybody here today is in some sense an experienced designer. And what that means is that we are all in the business of making people go somewhere and when they're in that place, try something new, a new behavior or to do something together, engage somehow in each other. And even if you weren't an experienced designer, you're probably human. And that means that, that you come with a lifetime of experience, of experiencing things as a human in physical and social environments. So basically, what's going to happen for the next brief half hour is that I'm just going to give some words to things that we all totally know, so that we also can talk about them uh, in a theoretical way. And I'm going to start with an example uh, from one of our lectures. Last year, you can see all of it uh, on the website. It's wonderful. It's by Sebastian Detterding, who's a play researcher. But I, I like this case. He talked about a museum of play where they had an installation, which was a room that looked like this, which you see behind the girls. And there's a camera. That's the red spot. Uh, that I think it's a heat camera. And when you dance in front of the screen, uh, it shows these wonderful colors uh, of you, your body dancing. Nobody used that installation. It's a wonderful idea, but nobody wants to do that. Because nobody, unless you're 11 years old, wants to go and dance in an empty room. And even then, there, you need there to be two people present, right? And they thought about this. And the way they solved it is that they turned off the lights, because the heat camera doesn't care. So they changed the physical environment, and as a consequence of that, the social dynamic of the situation changed. The alibi to interact, suddenly, I'm dancing in the dark, I don't even know what the other people are doing, but I can see them on that screen, so I can, via the screen, I can dance towards them a little bit, and maybe I can follow somebody's movements, and we can interact in a way, even as strangers, that we would never be able to do in that room in a museum normally. So in this case, the alibi for interaction, I don't know why I did this, because that's what we're calling it now, the alibi for interaction is the darkness, uh, and of course also the technology. Here's another uh, example. I tried this on a group of students last week. Um, is this normal behavior? All the Nordic people were like, yeah, sure. What you see in the, and the Italian and American were like this. What you see in this picture are some very normal, I just stole this off the internet, some very normal ladies in a Nordic Finland or Sweden, probably environment, have dressed one of their friends in some kind of man suit with a hang dangling cloth penis, painted a moustache on her face, and put a bridal veil on her head. What's going on here? Möhippa, yes, a hen party. Right. Even if, it, now they're at some, at some kind of country and country environment, but even if you saw them in the middle of a city where they probably were earlier this day, you would still accept this as normal behavior even if they were quite drunk and, and kissing you aggressively, and maybe they would throw the bride at you and she would stick her tongue in your mouth, which is a kind of behavior that we normally would find unacceptable in public space. Here you would still say, no, well, it's okay. Why is it okay? How do you know it's a hen party? Sorry? <laughs> Penis, one clue, yes. Related to fertility and sexuality, what else? 
Sorry, all women, yes. And uh, the veil is an obvious, so obvious that, that I didn't even hear you uh, yelling. The, the veil and the, the weird dress are, technically we would call these ludic markers. These are sig symbols that play is occurring. So they are bringing a bubble of play around them wherever they go. And if you have the con correct cultural, for this context, the assumed cultural context, you will look at these symbols and go, well, okay, it's a hemp party, so, so it's fine. So tradition is also very important. But what we learn here suddenly is that normal behavior is very, very relative, even within the confines of one culture. The idea of what is a normal thing to do in any given context is completely up for grabs, always. And we know this intuitively. That's why we can behave in most situations. We also fail at this all the time, because knowing the rules is very, very difficult, and that's where experience design comes in. So, an alibi for interaction is a social rule, a physical object, or a situation, or a context that allows someone to try a new behavior or a different behavior, uh, or to experience or initiate an interaction. So, the bride probably doesn't normally speak to strangers in the street or kiss people randomly at a bar. She might, and that would be totally fine. But, but even if she doesn't, on this day, wearing that weird outfit, she's allowed. Now, let's talk a little bit about what an experience is. Um, so, an experience... Just let's start from the very beginning. An experience exists in time. It has some kind of beginning, ending, progress, right? An experience exists in space. The reason for this is that the human bodies are physically located somewhere, and in the bodies are the brains and the nervous systems that are experiencing things. And even when some digital technology is involved, there are servers that are physically somewhere, and still, usually, if the servers are, are doing things between themselves and no humans are involved, we don't typically consider it an experience. An experience has a social dynamic, uh, even when you're alone, even when you're at a museum alone, dancing alone in a room, or not dancing alone. That experience has a social aspect. And an experience has narrative structure, because we as humans, we move through time and space. And this means, in its simplest terms, we could talk about this for hours, we're going to talk about it for like three seconds, it has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And in the middle, typically, something changes. We make stories of our lives. This is how we understand you know, one damn thing after another, and then we chop it up in bits and say, well, this morning to this end, how was your day? Is taking experience, like progress, process of, of, of input, and turning that into stories. Um, and sometimes it's very easy, to, because of, of internal coherence, to take a part of your life and say, well, this was an experience where something happened. But you can do this quite arbitrarily. We can also talk about like, the, the experience of going to the bathroom for the third time today. And then now that I said that, maybe that's going to be an experience for you. Maybe not. Um, so, if any part of life can be storified, then aren't we talking about everything in the universe? Well, yes, kind of. So, <laughs> so what, when we're designing, what we're usually doing at our jobs, whether we're librarians or, or, or have a dance company, um, we are designing experiences that are intended to engage or change people. We're typically working with a special kind of circle around life, we're what we call a magic circle. And it's a magic circle because inside the limits of that experience, the rules of engagement are different than outside, and the consequences are, are outside. So in the magic circle of play that the hen party has with it, certain kinds of sexual behavior, for instance, don't have the normal punishment consequences socially that they would have outside of that magic circle. And that's, a, that's something that we completely understand. In a sports rink, ice hockey again for the Nordic audience, you can probably pretty much punch someone in the face, and if you do it in the parking lot, you're going to be sued, even though it's the exact same answer. So the consequences are different, exact same behavior, right? So the consequences are different uh, inside the magic circle. Now, and if this sounds like something else, which it does, sure, it sounds like ritual, if you have an anthropological mindset. And that's where the term comes from originally, even though it's used in video games a lot as well today. So, um, a ritual is a, is a space-time uh, area, which has a beginning and an end, and something changes in the middle. And, and this is designed to happen on purpose with these special rules inside. So, 
just to take like a very everyday example or a trivial example from the Nordic countries, again, you take two humans, you put them inside a special building, for instance, a church. You have a person, often like a man in a dress or a woman in a dress with some magic powers and some magic objects and magic words. There has to be a ring in the ritual if this is a church wedding in the Nordic countries or the magic will not work. And they say uh, spe special words uh, have to be uttered at a specific moment, and then the legal status of the two humans getting married changes from unmarried to married, and they exit the building wed, uh, which they were not when they entered. That is a ritual. I mean, ritual sounds like occultism, and that is indeed also rituals, but rituals, of course, uh, are present in all cultures. And I think that when we design experiences, we need to think about them like rituals. Not necessarily in a religious sense, although, of course, that's totally cool if you design worship, which you can absolutely do with this toolkit, then, of course, then you are on designing something which is religious. But I think that the more important thing here is to think about designing something that is transformative. Because if you don't want to change the people engaging with your thing, what's the point of doing it? Even if it's just you want to change them, you want to make them feel that they're the kind of person who wants to try this product that you're trying to sell them. Even that is a kind of transformation. I think we can set the bar a little higher. That's my personal view. But if you want to just like move product, you can also absolutely use this toolkit for that. But let's aim for transformative, at least in some sense. Okay, narrative and experience, we've covered this. Now let's talk just a little bit about what is design. Because I said that we're all designers, and maybe some of you were like, no, no, I am totally not a designer. I am whatever it says on your business card. I think you are. So basically, design is about identifying limitations and being very clear about what your goals and aims are, or the goals and aims of your organization, if this is something that you do professionally. And then you match the, the, the goals and the needs with the resources available, and you make the most elegant solution possible, and then you have performed a design, which is wonderful. If you design an object, the kinds of resources that are available to you tend to be things like, or the kinds of aspects that you work with, are cost, time, materials, skill of craftsmen, limitations of production technology. But when you're designing experiences, you also have resources like pre-existing architecture, common behaviors, embodied experience, like for instance, what emotions, what does it feel like to have broken up with someone, and then you know that in your body, and then that is a resource for you as a designer. Another way of approaching this, of course, is to, to ask yourself, what is it you're doing when you're not making active choices? Uh, I think the answers, the words that could be the opposite of design are things like tradition and prejudice and just regurgitation, sloppy, doing what's always done. Um, a simple example of this, have you ever been to a bad party? Have you ever been unhappy at a party or bored? Yes, yes. yes. You know whereof I speak. Let's look at what kinds of actions are happening in this picture. What is happening here? What actions are being performed? Flirtation, yes. Talking. Exclusion. Boredom, boredom, I don't know, being bored, I guess. Sitting, right? Sitting, looking, looking away. Putting a bowl of crisps on a table and turning the music, music up very loud would be traditional in the context of parties in many cultures, but that is not the same thing as actively designing a good party for everybody. Now, in the Nordic countries, you put alcohol in, and alcohol is our strongest alibi, uh, and biologically speaking, inevitably, when enough people are drinking alcohol, behaviors will start to change in the room. I think if liquor is your only recourse, you are a very bad designer. Okay. You want to ask yourself, when you design an experience, what kinds of actions will my participants be doing? For instance, if you have an, an idea that they will be talking to each other, it's really important that they can hear each other's voices even when the music is on. And if you, you want them to maybe not talk, but dance, then you need it to be possible to dance without shame. Or invite people who have no shame. That's also a valid design strategy. Um, so I said before that any experience has narrative uh, structure. 
But more importantly, more specifically, of course, it's given narrative structure by the experiencer. It's just, it's still, what's actually going on is still just one damn thing after another. You are just intentionally helping them to frame it, right? So the participant is both the protagonist, that means main character, and the author of the story that is being created in this, in this narrative. So when we make experiences, we must understand that we are not storytellers. This story is told by every participant individually. And people forget about this all the time when they're trying to make an interactive or participatory or experiential things, especially in the theater, sometimes in games. The designers confuse the story that their, their work is inviting to explore with the story that the participants are making for themselves, which is what they will actually walk away with. That's the actual work, right? Every character is a main character, whether you're designing a tax office or a role-playing game. And this is where it gets interesting, because I cannot control the participant's story at all. I can't. But I can affect it, I can steer it, I can inspire it through the selection and the design of the physical and social environments. I can design spaces for other people's actions. And this is why it's so important to ask yourself what kinds of actions you want to happen in this experience. Sitting and watching and listening and learning is a completely valid action, by the way. But then, maybe if that's what you're designing for, make sure that people get to stand up every once in a while and maybe have some air and make sure there's enough coffee. I mean, that's all, these are all, you, you make the choices. All choices are available to you. But at least make sure the choices match the goals. So, what's the physical environment? Like it says on the sign, everything that has a physical presence uh, in the world, everything, uh, including everything that affects the senses automatically, like temperature, sound, smell, we are very, very affected by those things, as we're going to hear later today. Uh, and often, we don't think about that so much when we design. Well, we, of course, do, <laughs> but people don't. And the social environment, is everything that affects our agency, important word, I should have made a picture slide of that. Uh, agency is what am I able to do in these situations? What can I, what can I, which, which action can I, can, which actions can I do and what consequences can they have? How, how much can I affect what happens next? That's what, what my agency means, my act as an agent. So the kinds of things that make up the social environment are expectations, status hierarchies, social roles, values, cultural norms. Do not walk around with a pretended penis on your body outside your clothes. Unless, unless, you know, and the unless is the very important part here, that's what we're working with. So all of these things that, we, that I just mentioned, including very abstract things like echo or social dynamics, all of these things we consider designable surfaces. Anything that can be controlled, anything that affects the outcome and can theoretically be designed would be a designable surface. And the quality that you need to um, evaluate about every designable surface in your work is what does it afford? This is like a core term in, in design. What does, what does it allow me to do? So industrial designers are very good at this. We can look at these pliers and be like, yes, I see what I can do. I can throw it, I can cut with it, I can probably not make it cry. If you want to enable your participants to perform specific actions, then the, the physical and social environments need to afford those behaviors. If you block their ears so they cannot hear, conversation will not be a big part of your experience. Same thing if you turn the music up to 100. Um, so, the physical environment is designed through the balancing of objects, structures, spaces, surfaces, colors. And, and you don't have to build everything, obviously. Choice, selection is also a valid uh, tool for this. And light, sound, temperature, etc. And then to evaluate, as I said, you should evaluate the affordance of all of these things. Oh, how do you do that? Very simple. You ask yourself these kinds of questions. What does it feel like to be here? What can people do here? What can people not do here? Who am I in this space? What is this space trying to tell me about my role or what kinds of uh, emotions or movements, for instance, or agencies is created by these questions? How long would I like to stay here? Can I leave whenever I want to? And where should I go now? Uh, 
You know, the last question, basically the most important, put signs everywhere or a person telling people where they should go. Because the moment they are uncomfortable or lost, they will stop being brave and curious. And you want people brave and curious if you want them to engage with something to change. The social environment is designed through rules, suggestions, and the physical environment. So to evaluate the affordances of these designable surfaces, you want to ask yourself these kinds of questions. What is the atmosphere in this space? Who is the decider here? Yes, we have rules, but when the rules don't solve the problem, then who decides? Or who decides when we break the rules? What is my role among these people? What is my function in this process? Can I choose what I will do here? Do I feel safe here? Will this be embarrassing? If your participants are uncomfortable, uncertain, confused, awkward, mentally lost, not brave or curious, not safe, and there you are again. Um, how to behave in a specific setting is never obvious. And this is really important because most people have different backgrounds, and not just culturally and socioeconomically. We're talking about social skills, bodies, experiences, expectations. Some people are shy, some people are neurodivergent. And by the way, everyone will have some kind of, of, uh, uh, of, of physical limitation uh, sooner or later. That's called aging. Uh, so just make places and processes accessible for the people you're trying to, uh, to reach. And now, of course, you're like, oh, every person is different. It's, and all the surfaces in the world are, are objects of design. So this sounds too difficult. Yes, it is. It's, it's a big thing, right? So, but don't panic, because we don't actually, usually, we don't, we don't design for every hypothetical individual in the universe. We design for a group of people. Even if it's an, an arbitrary group of people, the group of people who end up at your thing, you can even pick them randomly in the street, but they have some qualities in common. I love this term. It's from a game designer called Teresa Axner, herd competence. It's not what do you as an individual know how to do. What does this group know how to do? What is this group able to do together? So the, here you are thinking about the available resources of social scripts and cultural context and expectations and experiences that dominate in the group. And you always need to remember the people who are not typical for the group, but in many ways, when you're trying to get them to do things, they can be carried by the competence of the group. What do I mean? I mean, I'm uncomfortable, but you guys seem to know what you're doing, so I'm just going to do what you do. That's herd competence. And then when I've done that action, then I have the, I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm on top of this, so then I can teach the next person as well. This is a burden, because here is prejudice and tradition and culture and everything that you might want to be, be working against, but this is also an enormous possibility. And of course, you make the choices of which aspects of this to work with. Um, the business of designing experiences is the business of designing what kinds of worlds we live in. That's basically what I'm saying. Because if every magic circle that we design, again, whether it's just like a really good customer experience or um, a party for 50,000 people in the desert or a really nice wedding or a birthday party for a five-year-old, or a conference, indeed, <laughs> then if, if each of those magic circles is, is, is its own universe, and we say that, that the, the, the nature of social and physical reality is that, that those can be different from what's happening outside, then that comes with, with some moral baggage, right? It's a pretty demanding thing if you're made God, if you make yourself God over a situation, and again, like, oh, you make yourself God over a situation where your participants are humans. So they're going to do whatever they want and, and rebel and not be logical and put their elbow in somebody else's coffee cup like I did this morning and then pull ink all over their hands. So these are the kinds of geniuses you're working with. <laughs> but still, in that context, I mean, over in that situation, in some way you are God. You have to think about what kind of God you want to be. 
what kind of society are you creating here? And maybe you want to decide that all your participants get to decide that together. Okay, fine, and that's also a valid design way. But then what if they design something that you don't stand for at all? What if, what if they make something that you hate or that is cruel? I mean, these are big forces. And we can use them for good or we can use them for evil, and then you get to decide what's good or evil for you. But I think it's important, whether you're in advertising or uh, in childcare, you know, to think about what that means. What is an ethical way of, of using these powers that everybody knows, but few people, it turns out, in the actual outside real world, have this geek interest in the dynamics of how this works. So it's very easy to play people as well. If you don't want to play people, who do you want to be then? I think that a good bar to set is that we're trying to design a better world and a more sustainable, resilient culture. Um, that's, that's what I think. But you, you, you get to pick your own. Uh, but the tool that we're working with is physical and social environments that allow for humans to explore, reflect, play, transform, uh, whether separately or together. I'm um, approaching the end of this introduction. There's a shorter part two that I'm going to do tomorrow morning. Um, so, but I'll, I just want to establish some social rules for this, uh, these two days that we have together. So the first one is speak English. Many of you are uh, from Sweden and Denmark, but absolutely not all. And so a nice thing to try and do is to try and speak English at all times. Of course, it's weird if, if, it's, you know, if you're here with your colleague from the next desk and you have another language together, you can, of course, speak that language, but then switch to English if somebody that you don't know walks past, uh, because it makes it possible for us to meet. And now, of course, most of us are still strangers, but we'll do some things later today where we will have met each other in a natural way, so, so do, do keep this in mind. Um, the other thing is, is a, a rule that we call the empty chair rule. And it's both a physical and a metaphorical rule. It means that if you sit down outside in a group of people and you talk, try and leave a chair empty if there are any chairs left. And that means anyone can walk past and join the conversation. Then you can walk. If there's an empty chair and people are talking and it looks like, like they are having a good time, I now give you the alibi. Indeed, I urge you strongly to walk up to them and say, hi, can I join you? And then they will say, yes, of course, we're talking about this. And then you can sit and listen in until you're in it, and then you can contribute to the conversation. See how that works. Now, often we will not have chairs, <laughs> but I think we can have the mental empty chair. Don't force people to participate like the Queen is doing here. Sit down, you. Maybe somebody needs some alone time or some reflection, and that is also completely okay at this place where we are at Alibis, it's always okay to opt out. You can always choose not to participate or to stand by the wall and observe, because we are thinkers. I think everybody needs to do a lot of processing, and there's a lot of information coming in the next few days. So it's totally okay also to do that. And downstairs in the cafe, where you can always find coffee, we also have some like work spaces where, where you're meant to not talk to each other. So if you want to sit with other people who are also not talking, you can go there or just find somewhere else. The most important rule Let's be grown-ups. That means that even though many things are provided for you here, at, you know, the food will show up at specific times and instructions on where to go and so on, don't turn into a child. We're all professionals, you know? <laughs> if you need something, get it or ask for it or ask for help. If you, instead of being worried, like, we're all pretty friendly, find someone who looks like they work here and talk to them or just ask a random person. And if you find that you're in a lecture and it's not the thing for you and everything is weird and freaky or totally irrelevant or you totally had this exact same lecturer at university last week, you know, just, you can leave the room. Nobody will be upset. It's a Thursday. You may have a job, I'm assuming most of you do. Maybe you have emails you need to answer again. Don't worry about it. If you're too stressed to focus, go out and answer the emails. It's fine. We make our own rules here, right? We, we make our own experience together. Um, we're going to be grown-ups, uh, but we're also going to have fun. And to me, as a Finn, 
uh, that means it's terrifying. I'm always very worried that somebody's going to force me to play, and we have a hypnotist on in the program later, so that's a terror all in itself. <laughs> but once again, I have been assured that like everything else we do here, nothing is coincidental, but also nothing you know, will be forced upon you. We have these choices, right? Okay, thank you very much.